And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission. One message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, the news program that reports the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God. I'm Rick Wiles. Welcome to one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. The Sunday Times in London reported that Israel and Saudi Arabia are working together on a plan to bomb Iran. The newspaper said Barack Obama's foreign policies in the Middle East have united both countries in a common cause to stop Iran's quest to develop a nuclear weapons arsenal. The Sunday Times said the Israeli and Saudi governments are convinced that the talks in Geneva amount to appeasement and will do little to slow down Iran's nuclear program. A source told the Times that the Saudis are furious with Obama and are willing to give Israel all the help it needs to take out Iran's nuclear facilities. According to the Sunday Times, Riyadh has agreed to let Israel use its airspace in a military strike on Iran and to cooperate over the use of rescue helicopters, tanker planes, and drones. Last month, the Sunday Times reported that the Israeli Air Force had staged a long-range bombing exercise over Greek airspace to demonstrate that it would be prepared to go alone, if necessary, in order to bomb Tehran's nuclear facilities. The BBC reported last week that the Saudis will soon be nuclear-armed, too. They reportedly funded the Pakistani nuclear weapons program, with the caveat that they could get their hands on Pakistani nukes any time they wanted some. Apparently, the Saudis are cashing in those poker chips to claim the prize, shiny new Pakistani nuclear warheads sitting on top of ICBMs. The bottom line is that Barack Obama's policies have resulted in the start of a Middle East nuclear weapons arms race. This is something we have never witnessed until the last two months. I've always suspected that Barack Obama is a Saudi foreign agent. But how do we explain the Saudi anger with him? Has the Mac Daddy double-crossed his Saudi paymasters? Or has the Mac Daddy set the stage for the Saudis to acquire nuclear weapons? We live in a world of smoke and mirrors, where nothing is as it seems on the surface, a world that has layer upon layer of deception and intrigue. Is Barack Obama a foreign agent, or a double agent, or a quadruple agent? Who really is Barry Sotoro's true master? What we do know is that his foreign policies have wrecked America's longstanding relationships with allies in the Middle East, and have sown disorder, chaos, and mistrust throughout the region. He totally fumbled the ball regarding Syria. Was it by accident, or incompetence, or on purpose? We don't know. He drew a red line, then swore that he didn't draw the line, and said that the U.N. drew the line. As French bombers stood by to launch a wave of attacks on Syria at 3 a.m. on August 31st, Barry Satoro suddenly called off the war. Did he get cold feet, or did Vladimir Putin threaten him with World War III? Regardless of the reason, Barack Obama backed down. He withdrew the U.S. naval fleet from the Mediterranean, and the Russian naval fleet swooped in to control the sea. In 2011, Mr. Obama used the CIA to bring down Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak. He clandestinely schemed to instigate a revolution in Egypt that brought the Muslim Brotherhood to power. 
when the Egyptian army army finally got fed up with the Brotherhood's abuse of the Egyptian people and overthrew the regime, Mr. Obama sided with the Muslim Brotherhood and angered the Egyptian army. Now the Egyptian military is getting cozy with the Russians and preparing to buy billions of Russian weapons and allow the Russian Navy to establish a base at an Egyptian port. Once again, who is he working for? What is the end result of Mr. Obama's policies? The end result is America gets weaker and America's adversaries get stronger. Raymond Ibrahim was on True News last week. He talked about the criminal charges that an Egyptian law professor and a team of lawyers filed in the International Criminal Court against Barack Obama and his Muslim Brotherhood half-brother Malik Obama. Malik is the bagman for a Muslim Brotherhood outfit based in Sudan. And we all know about the death and destruction the Muslims have inflicted on the Christians of Sudan. Malik Obama holds the purse strings of a Muslim Brotherhood jihadist group. Now here's uh, something to think about. The deposed Muslim Brotherhood thug Mohammed Morsi, that's Mr. Obama's Muslim buddy, is standing trial in Cairo on charges of high treason. When the Egyptian army overthrew the Brotherhood, they got their hands on a lot of internal documents. And I, I think we should be praying that somebody in Egypt will follow the paper trail because I suspect it will lead all the way to the White House. There are rumors that the Egyptian army recorded Morsi's telephone calls to al-Qaeda leaders such as Aman al-Zawari. If the Egyptian court finds Morsi guilty of conspiring with al-Qaeda and foreign governments to carry out acts of terrorism against Egypt, he will be facing the death penalty. There is a strong possibility that Egyptian prosecutors could name Barack Obama as a co-conspirator. The Egyptian army reportedly suspects that some of the $8 billion in U.S. foreign aid that Barry Sotoro funneled to the Muslim Brotherhood regime was then transferred by Morsi to establish a Hamas military presence in the Sinai. And then little Lindsey Graham and old John McCain could get caught in the mouse trap too. The Egyptian court is expected to hear evidence of how Senators McCain and Graham traveled to Cairo to pressure Egyptian officials to release the Muslim Brotherhood thugs who had been arrested. The former chief of, of Egyptian intelligence is expected to present evidence in the trial showing the Muslim Brotherhood is dry, directly linked to the CIA and that Barry Satoro, alias Barack Hussein Obama, incited the Brotherhood to go into the streets of, of Cairo prior to the revolution. Egyptian news sources reported that the Muslim Brotherhood and the CIA conspired to cause chaos through riots that would lead to the collapse of President Hosni Mubarak's government. Last summer, the son of a top Muslim Brotherhood leader told a Turkish news agency that his jailed father, Kaharat al shatter had in his hands evidence that would put Barack Obama in prison. His threat is what sent John McCain and Lindsey Graham scurrying to Egypt to try to talk to the father in prison. Whatever he has, it must be juicy. Perhaps it's enough to send Graham and McCain to prison, too, with Barack Obama. Now, going back to the subject of an Israeli attack on Iran, the man who was Benjamin Netanyahu's national security advisor until last week said today that Israel has the capability of halting Iran's program for a long, long time. Yaakov Amador told London's Financial Times that Mr. Netanyahu is ready to make the necessary decision 
but that the situation will dictate the actions. He said that the Israeli Air Force has conducted very long-range flights all around the world as part of preparations for a possible war with Iran. He told the Financial Times, quote, All those who have radar cover of the Middle East know what we are doing, end of quote. He hinted that Israel is prepared to use tactical nuclear warheads, although he didn't use the word warheads. He hinted by saying that they would have everything at their disposal. He said that they would be prepared to use anything and everything against Iran's deep subterranean nuclear sites. He said, quote, we are not bluffing. We are very serious, preparing ourselves for the possibility that Israel will have to defend itself by itself, end of quote. Mr. Uh, Amador also said Israel is prepared for a ground invasion of Lebanon if Hezbollah launches thousands of rockets into Israel in response to an attack on Iran. Now, the next round of Western talks with Iran start on Wednesday in Geneva. Israel's Channel 10 News, however, reported that the Geneva talks are a facade because the terms of the real deal were worked out over the past year during secret talks between the White House and Tehran. I'm waiting until you hear this. The Israeli TV news report said that the secret negotiations were conducted by Barack Obama's brain, Chicago political thug Valerie Jarrett. The U.S. State Department did not keep Israel informed about the secret talks. According to Channel 10, Valerie Jarrett's secret diplomacy marginalized Secretary of State John Kerry by relegating him to a bit player, by compelling him to fly to Geneva to sign a deal in which he had hardly any role in crafting. The Saudi-Israel-French wall of resistance, however, derailed the plan, and Mr. Kerry left Geneva with his ink pen still in his pocket and no deal signed. Now, Asian and Middle Eastern newspapers reported in 2012 prior to Benghazi, that White House advisor Valerie Jarrett was meeting secretly with Iranians for an October surprise before the November elections. By the way, Valerie Jarrett was born in Iran. The New York Times reported that the U.S. State Department wants to allow Russia to build a network of GPS ground stations on American soil to improve the accuracy of its own GLOSNOS global positioning system. The U.S. State Department says it's a great way for America to improve its relations with Russia. The Pentagon and U.S. intelligence agencies, however, disagree with the State Department. They say the GPS ground stations inside America could be used to better guide satellite weapons targeting the U.S., and that the stations could be used to spy on American communications. The New York Times said the Russian military fears U.S. dominance in GPS capabilities. Therefore, the U.S. State Department wants to help level the playing field by letting Russia set up GPS stations across the USA. Now, truthfully, I... I'm not surprised to hear about this crazy idea coming from the U.S. State Department. The State Department has been infested with communists and traitors since the 1940s. Senator Joseph McCarthy was right. Congressman Mike Rogers, chairman of a House Armed Services Subcommittee, said he wants to know why the U.S. would be interested in enabling the Russians to have a GPS system inside the USA. Well, Congressman, the answer is the same as why Chinese PLA troops were in Hawaii last week. It's because Washington is infested with traitors. That's the answer. 
Japan placed its air force on alert after two Russian nuclear bombers flew near its airspace over the weekend. Two Tu-95 strategic bombers were spotted off Tokyo over the Pacific on Sunday. The Japanese military has gone on alert 105 times between July and September of this year because of Russian military aircraft flying near its airspace. Well, let's turn our attention to end-time weather events. A violent storm brought an unusual wave of late fall tornadoes to the Midwest uh, to the Midwestern U.S. on Sunday. The trail of destruction spread across 12 states, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, Missouri, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and even as far east as western New York State. And there were 81 reported tornadoes, 358 reports of damaging winds, and 40 reports of large hail. A storm of this magnitude and violence this late in the season is very unusual. Let me put it in perspective for you. In the state of Illinois alone, there have been 194 tornado warnings issued in the month of November since the year 1986. 194 tornado warnings issued in the month of November since 1986 in the state of Illinois. Now listen to this. 101 of those 194 warnings were issued on Sunday. Does that put it in perspective? WGN-TV weather forecaster Tom Skilling said the storm may have produced the most powerful tornado on record in Illinois in the month of November. He also said it may be the most intense storm in the Great Lakes region in the past 50 years. A powerful 7.8 magnitude earthquake Undersea earthquakes struck in the Scotia Sea, a remote region in the far south Atlantic near Antarctica. Uh, The quake, um, this is not the the first time uh, in recent days. I I would suggest that you keep keep an eye on the Scotia Sea. Uh, There have been a series of strong earthquakes under the seabed. Uh, just uh, days ago, before this big 7.8 magnitude quake, uh, there was a magnitude 6.8 earthquake undersea. Again, this latest one, very strong, very powerful, magnitude 7.8 earthquake rumbling beneath the sea approximately 1,100 uh, miles southwest of the Falkland Islands. Now, geologists have discovered an active volcano hidden beneath a massive ice sheet below West Antarctica. It was discovered after a series of earthquake swarms in the region, and the geologists saw the magma action. Now, if the volcano erupts, scientists said it would melt the bottom of the Antarctic ice sheet. They aren't sure what would happen next because the ice is more than a half mile thick. They said it would take a super volcano eruption on the scale of Yellowstone to completely melt the ice above the volcano. Italy's Mount Etna lit up the skies uh, Saturday over Sicily. The eruption died down on Sunday. No evacuations. Space scientists are scratching their heads over the sun's latest antics. The sun is supposed to be in the grand finale of its latest solar cycle. Instead, it has almost fallen asleep. Sunspots have nearly disappeared. Low or no sunspot activity means cold temperatures on the Earth. Meanwhile, the sun's magnetic field is on the verge of flipping upside down as its north and south poles swap sides. It happens every 11 years in conjunction with the solar cycles. The flipping of the sun's polarity can spark geomagnetic storms which interfere with satellite and radio and TV broadcasts. Now, here is what is weird. The sun's north pole 
flipped to the South Pole last year. But the South Pole did not flip to the North Pole. Yet, that means the sun now has two South Poles. And it's had two South Poles for a year. Dr. Ken Tapping from the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory in British Columbia told CBC News in Canada that this is causing some concern because it would be nice for the sun to settle back into its typical rhythms. He told the CBC, quote, Obviously, we would feel happier if we saw the sun doing business as usual rather than heading off into some territory where we basically are not sure we understand what's going to happen. End of quote. I've got a question for the scientists. How do we know that the sun isn't settling into some cyclical rhythm that modern mankind has never witnessed? Now, there's something for you to pause and consider. See, things are happening, friends. Things are happening in the universe that the scientists have no explanation. They don't know how to explain it. They're watching. They're, they're discussing it privately. They are wondering, why are these things happening? And they're watching the sun right now, and it doesn't make sense what it's doing. And they're concerned. They actually say, we're concerned. We wish the sun wouldn't behave this way. It would be nice if the sun would behave in its normal manner. Well, we're not living in normal times. We're living in the end times. And and we're about to see the greatest event that this planet has ever seen, and that is the second coming of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ splits the eastern sky and returns in a glorious way for the body of Christ. And that is about to happen. But before that happens, there's a lot of other things that have to happen. And you and I are going to witness a lot of things, including persecution and tribulation and great signs. But we're also going to be on the forefront of preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God to every tribe and nation. Now, I think you know where I'm going with this uh, end-time weather report, uh, a mini ice age. As I said, low sunspots mean colder temperatures on Earth. Uh, During a low solar activity cycle, the jet streams on the Earth move in a vastly different pattern. It means frigid Arctic air from the North North Pole swoops down, on much of the northern hemisphere, and frigid frigid Arctic air from the South Pole swoops over much of the southern hemisphere. The only warm zone is directly north and south of the equator. And so if you're in the western hemisphere, in the next uh, few years, I think Ecuador, Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Mexico, the Caribbean islands could be looking really good. Uh, Depending on how big of a down cycle the sun is entering, this ice age could last from 40 years to 70 years, up to 200 years. For most of us, even the low number of 40 years means many of us will not live long enough to see it end. Now, earlier this, this year, some of you were making fun of me for warning that an ice age would start this winter. Last week... None other than the Wall Street Journal published an article titled Strange Doings on the Sun. And the Wall Street Journal said, Something is up with the sun. Scientists say that solar activity is stranger than in a century or more, with the sun producing barely half the number of sunspots as expected, and its magnetic poles oddly out of sync. I'll see A year ago, some of you were laughing at me. Some of you were mocking me. Some of you were sending me emails saying, get real, Rick. Talk about Bible prophecy. Stop this goofy talk about an ice age. But see, you don't understand how an ice age can be connected to Bible prophecy. Well, you're you're going to find out fairly soon. uh, You ought to read this Wall Street Journal report. David Hathaway head of solar physics groups at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, said this is the weakest solar cycle in 200 years. 
Uh, another one, Andres Munoz uh, Jaramillo of the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics said, there is no scientist alive who has seen a solar cycle as weak as this one. And, um, you know, I've been, throughout this whole year, I've been, I've been telling my audience, take time to get ready. If you live in an area that has cold weather and snow, take the time that you have before winter and get ready for it. And I hope, I hope those of you who lived in northern regions heeded my advice. Let me tell you something. Folks living in Great Britain were told over the weekend that that country is facing a month-long Arctic freeze as a huge swath of bitter, cold air sweeps in from the North Pole. The big freeze will bring the first snowfall to the U.K. this year. Blizzard conditions could exist in many regions and last for weeks. The London Express said long-range weather forecasters have warned that Britain should prepare for heavy and persistent snow for up to three months, with winter 2013-14 set to be the worst in more than 60 years. The latest detailed forecasts all point towards months of relentless extreme cold with heavy snow extremely likely across the country. Arctic air will roar in from the North Pole, triggering the start of the worst winter in many people's lifetimes. That's the London Express newspaper over the weekend. They're saying it's going to be one of the worst winters that anybody has ever seen in Great Britain. In fact, they're comparing it to the winter of 1947, which saw the country hit with relentless snow and cold temperatures throughout the whole winter. The the weather forecasters are saying that snow may last, continue to fall in Great Britain up until March. This is going to be a winter of non-stop snowing. Uh, James Madden, forecaster for Exacta Weather, said Britain is braced for copious snowfall this winter with extreme cold expected, expected to last into spring. He said that Britain faces an incomparable scenario to anything we have witnessed in modern times. A prolonged period of widespread cold is highly likely to develop throughout the winter and last into spring. It will be accompanied by snow drifts of several feet and long-lasting snow accumulations on widespread scale. This period of snow and cold is likely to result in, in an incomparable scenario to anything we have experienced in modern times. So how is an ice age related to Bible prophecy? First, for some unknown scientific reason, volcanic eruptions increase during an ice age. The dust in the atmosphere worsens the cooling of the planet. Second, an ice age will produce famines, wars, civil unrest, and mass migration of populations seeking warmth and food. Does that sound like Bible prophecy to you now? See, you've never heard this before from from the established Bible prophecy teachers. But I'm telling you, you've got to you've got to clean the slate inside your head. You've got to you gotta erase everything that you've been taught and you've got to rethink everything and you've got to compare it in in relation to what is really going on in the world right now. And I truly believe we're going into an ice age, and it will result in many of these prophecies being fulfilled as we move towards the end of time and the return of Jesus Christ. i got to take a break. I'll be back in a minute with my guest, and we're going to be talking about China's threats to nuke American cities. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. This is Max McLean. Many Jews may have been indifferent to the birth of Jesus, but some foreigners traveled far and long to worship him. Listen to the Bible from Matthew 2. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. 
and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. From Matthew 2, listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. Hear more at RadioBible.org. That's RadioBible.org. You're listening to True News, your alternative source for global news, analysis, and commentary. I'm Rick Wiles. In late October, China publicly revealed a fleet of older nuclear submarines. Chinese state TV showed video of the submarines firing missiles from under the sea. The carefully choreographed propaganda campaign was followed by China Central TV, the China Times, the PLA Daily, and the People's Daily Newspapers, publishing identical articles and maps of the USA showing the American cities that will be nuked by Chinese submarines off the west coast of America and ICBMs flying over the North Pole. The Chinese news reports estimated that up to 12 million Americans could perish on the west coast. They specifically named Seattle, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and San Diego as nuclear strike targets. The Global Times said, quote, In general, after a nuclear missile strikes a city, the radioactive dust produced by 20 warheads will be spread by the wind, forming a contaminated area for thousands of kilometers. The survival probability for people outdoors in a 12,000 to 14,000 kilometer radius is basically zero, based on the actual level of China's 1 million tons TNT equivalent, small nuclear warhead technology, the 12 JL-2 nuclear missiles carried on one Type 094 nuclear submarine could cause the destruction of 5 million to 12 million people, forming a very clear deterrent effect, end of quote. Chinese media also revealed that China's H-6 twin-engine medium-range jet is now equipped with four nuclear-armed land attack cruise missiles. The bomber's range would allow them to reach Okinawa, Guam, and Hawaii. What was the Pentagon's response to Beijing's nuclear war saber-rattling? U.S. Navy Admiral Jonathan Greenert, Chief of Naval Operations, told the audience attending the Reagan National Defense Forum at the Reagan Library that China's threat to use submarine-launched nuclear missiles to attack America lacks credibility. He said, quote, For a submarine-launched ballistic missile to be effective, it has to be accurate, and you have to be stealthy and survivable, and I'll leave it at that, end of quote. Well, do the Chinese presently have the military capability of carrying out a surprise nuclear attack on the U.S.? If not, when will they reach military parity? Chinese military expert Mr. Miles Yu is on the telephone. His columns appear in the Washington Times. Miles, welcome back to True News. Well, welcome back. Yes, yes sir. Glad to be back. Yes, sir. I'm glad to have you back. Um, Miles, uh, first of all, let's start with this uh, uh, this uh, blast of, of uh, uh, propaganda that came out of China several weeks ago. Um, are the Chinese uh, simply trying to um, uh, just mess with the minds of the American people, or are they really threatening to nuke this country? Well, that's hard to say. It's hard of propaganda because it left you guessing. I think, you know, uh, the the U.S. is not afraid of uh, the British uh, nuclear uh, missile attack and is not uh, afraid of the French nuclear missile attack on India for that, uh, for that reason. Uh, because we know that uh, those countries uh, all have capability. But what's so startling in this case, in the Chinese case, is that they they actually draw up graphics. They talk about the, uh, how many bombs will kill how many million, millions of Americans in specific cities like Seattle and Los Angeles. They have this very graphic picture. Uh, so that's where it is. I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, hostility involved in there or intended in there. Uh, it is not the graphic nature of such threat that really makes people take uh, take it back. Now, uh, I don't know whether the Chinese uh, leadership has made a decision and said this is what we're going to do. Uh, China does have a, a non-first strike policy, but the, recently the Chinese military has been uh, on the front page of uh, all the reports. They're taking, taking charge of a lot of things. 
the current leadership in Beijing obviously has a greatly narrowed the gap between the civilian leadership and the military leadership. It looks like they're the same in many uh, uh, key uh, areas, particularly when it comes to uh, military build-up. Uh, Miles, in, inside the, the PLA, is there a growing number of, of young, war-hungry military leaders, colonels, and uh, up-and-coming military leaders that are putting pressure on the older generals and the politicians to, to challenge the U.S. militarily? I think that's a very complex question, which uh, uh, requires the uh, complex answer. The, uh, uh, made, uh, make a long story short, what you have here is uh, you have a lot of professional military uh, personnel inside the PLA who know what a megaton uh, actually means uh, to the target. You also have a large number of what we call the political commissar. This political commissar, their job is to keep the, uh, the troops uh, totally loyal to the party. And many of them uh, are uh, uh, graduates of, uh, say, the Chinese language department or literature department. So they have the romantic views uh, of warfare. And those people uh, write articles and uh, provide uh, advice and the consultation to top leaders in a very romantic, unrealistic, and even macabre way. So if you are a really professional military, you don't draw up a graphic saying we're going to bomb Los Angeles, killing 5 million Americans. That's just uh, totally stupid. I mean, I don't know whether that group of political commissars has actually uh, uh, sort of uh, taken the position at a senior level and sometimes you actually have to wonder to what extent and uh, the uh, Chinese supreme leadership listen to the professional soldiers or the political commissars. That's a very complicated, complicated question. Mm -hmm. well, with the exception of limited action in the Korean War and the Vietnam War, uh, the, the Chinese military has not been engaged in actual combat operations. So, so you have a uh, lot. You have a lot of military. Officers who've never been on a battlefield. You're absolutely right. Absence of a major military involvement uh, requires, basically means that a lot of Chinese officers uh, do not have a real battlefield experience. Uh, if you like American military uh, uh, officer group particularly, they have been battle-hardened, they've been to many wars, and they know what war was like. So their, their remarks are very professional, circumspect, and realistic. China does not have that. Much of China's uh, war-mongering rhetoric has also uh, uh, linked, is also linked to the intrinsic nature of China's propaganda machine. That is, they sometimes forget what is propaganda, what is the real talk of war. And they, when you talk about instrument of war, and uh, it's entirely different from the domestic, uh, socialistic, realistic uh, propaganda uh, in China. So uh, I think these two forces in China sometimes were not uh, distinguishable, uh, which is really a danger. Mm -hmm. The fact that they haven't been on the battlefield, is this growing war fever very dangerous? Should we should we be concerned that there is a, a war fever growing among the younger military leaders? Uh, without saying that is the case. Um, however, the um, war fever uh, grows because of some major miscalculation of the uh, capabilities, say, of the United States, even some regional powers, such as Japan or India. Uh, that's because uh, uh, the Chinese have the very uh, skewed view of what American military doctrine uh, is and has been. They think because the United States has been very casualty-averse, and if we, if the Chinese deal a, deals a heavy blow to the American military forces through uh, shock and awe, for example, and Americans would retract. And that's exactly what the Japanese were thinking before Pearl Harbor. What they couldn't figure out was what a sinking of American military or dropping a bomb on Los Angeles might do to the American nation as a whole to counterattack China. So... That's basically the limitation of China's strategic vision, and many of them do not have it. So mm -hmm. in this case, so in this case, I agree. In this sense, I agree with Admiral uh, Greener 100. percent And because we have the confidence, we have the capability. 
to counterattack China should such thing happen. And uh, the, the danger is you have convinced the Chinese leadership that the Americans have multiple times more powerful capability to prevent China from risking the nuclear war. Uh, Miles, what is driving the Chinese hostility towards the U.S.? Well, China basically has the original ambitions. They, uh, China has a, a, a borders with uh, 13 countries. Virtually, it has a territorial dispute, the border dispute with uh, virtually every one of them. So the United States does not share a border with China. The United States does not have any territorial, even historical dispute with China. What the U.S. has is a preponderance of force to keep peace. To the regional powers, do not fight because peace is beneficial to all of us. And for that, and the U.S. Uh, become China's top, uh, uh, if not the enemy, at least the adversary, because the U.S. is always in a way uh, 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 for China when China wants to, say, uh, have a pick a fight with Japan, the Philippines, or Vietnam. So U.S. is always there as a peace guarantor. This has been going on for the last four or five decades. So... In order for China to uh, fulfill its ambition to to dominate Asia, it has to eliminate the U.S. as a protector of those Asian rivals. Uh, that, at least uh, from China's point of view, that is the strategic calculation. If not attack the U.S., at least uh, neutralize the United States, which is the case that they have been uh, doing so far in order to hop up with the United States uh, to isolate Japan, which was the China's uh, uh, leading contender in the Northeast Asia region. Uh, from the U.S. point of view, U.S.-Japan defense alliance has always been a cornerstone of American strategy in Asia-Pacific. So that's why in uh, Washington's calculation, the U.S.-Japan relationship is actually key. All right. Admiral Grenard uh, said that um, in order for a, a submarine uh, surprise attack to, to uh, take place, they have to be effect- it has to be effective and it has to be accurate and it has to be stealthy. Um, obviously, he's, he's alluding to the fact that he doesn't believe that the, that the old Chinese subs uh, could get that close to America to carry out uh, a surprise attack. Well, they don't have to be on our shores. I mean, they could be. 1,500 miles away and still launch uh, missiles into West Coast cities. But the other thing, Miles, is that you know, but, but two years ago, we still have that strange event that took place off the coast of Catalina Island uh, off uh, near Los Angeles when an ICBM uh, came up out of the Pacific and, and a television crew and a helicopter videoed it, and nobody could explain what it was, where it came from. And um, I had uh, 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 General Jim West on this program, who was the deputy commander of NORAD, at, 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 at formerly, and he said, without a doubt, it was an ICBM. He said, I don't know where it came from. He said, my guess is it was launched from a Chinese sub. He said, I can't prove it, but I do know it was an ICBM. If that was a Chinese-launched uh, missile, that close to, to L.A., then they do have the stealth capability to get that close to our country. Well, I, I really can't answer that question because, uh, as, you, as you mentioned in your introduction to this particular news item, <laughs> there's no open publication on any of this. Mm-hmm. Absence of a, uh, of a uh, uh, really tactical intelligence uh, uh, analysis, I really don't know uh, mm-hmm. what that was. Even if, you know, well, uh, it was uh, a Chinese sub. I'm sure that Ad- Admiral uh, Grinnert uh, indicated it with confidence that we do know what what's going on. And I, in that case, you know, I think the issue is that you have to convince the Chinese that there is a much more uh, bigger stake uh, here, and the U.S. does have the capability to detect and prevent Chinese from risking a nuclear war with with the U.S. Well, Miles, but what about a uh what about a cyber attack prior to a nuclear attack? I mean, well, that's that's in the in the area of uh, um, of asymmetrical warfare, which is, uh, in my view, a much more deadly and much more potentially dangerous to the American uh, infrastructure and also particularly a uh, war command and control system. That's because you can utilize a relatively small 
assets in China, and it can disable uh, Americans' uh, way to conduct war. And so, in other sense, you know, the uh, cyber attack, ASAC capabilities, uh, as well as uh, uh, the infiltration into Americans' uh, uh, infrastructure and power grids, for example, uh, water supply, those things were all re- was very, very dangerous. And I think um, since 9-11, we all know the uh, importance of asymmetrical warfare and the counter uh, that kind of uh, uh, warfare. And I think uh, uh, many people in this country are doing just that. Um, I don't know to what extent the China uh, has posed uh, a great threat, but uh, from what I read in open publication, China has been doing um, uh, in a uh, much faster way than we have because they have concentrated their commitment, uh, financial personnel and leadership commitment to that kind of a thing. Um, and, and I think, you know, this, uh, this is something that our nation should be worried about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, their, their, their submarine fleet may be old, but their cyber capabilities are quite advanced. Their submarine fleet is not necessarily the old. They have been um, doing submarines since 1950s, but they have uh, a lot of uh, diesel-electric submarines. But they also have uh, uh, leapfrog submarine technologies by importing from Russia, for example. The kilo-class subs is quite good. Um, they also have about 10 nuclear power subs, and about three or four of them are uh, ballistic and missile subs, uh, what we call boomers. And um, they're getting better and better. I mean, I don't think they're they're as good as ours, but, uh, you know, you never know. In this uh, game of uh, underwater warfare, many of this stuff is not supposed to be revealed to the enemy. So we have to be very careful. Mm -hmm. Uh, Going back to the war fever in China, is it being... uh, Is it being... uh, um propelled also by the fact that the Chinese are smelling blood in the water uh, regarding the USA. Uh, Financially, the U.S. has had major problems for the last seven years. Um, The country is divided. It's, uh, um, you know, we're blundering in the Middle East. We've we've alienated uh, uh, allies. Uh, The the NSA uh, revelations have, have angered uh, many countries around the world are are the Chinese smelling blood in the water, saying, "Hey, right now the Americans are in a weakened position." Well, the U.S. definitely is in a weakened position because of the reasons that you you listed. However, I also have to uh, to mention this: the fact that there is a very um, dangerous trend in China that is the overestimate the extent to which America is weakened, particularly militarily. So that further encouraged their aggressive stand toward the United States. And I think, you know, uh, that's why the United States announced pivot to Asia. The so-called rebalancing is crucial because despite all these uh, financial woes and the leadership woes the nation has been suffering, the United States is the indisputable leader, indisputable leader in Asia Pacific. And we stick to that uh, Asia pivot strategy and I think we will be in a better position. Unfortunately, we see now the will to carry out that policy is waning. So uh, that's something that uh, I am personally uh, quite worried about. All right. How does um, Chinese military policy intersect with Chinese financial policies? In well, China's financial policy, China's financial policy, China's foreign policy is all about one thing, leverage. They basically want to create something that you have to be re- dependent upon them, and then they make a demand. Uh, that's true, uh, not only on the uh, geopolitical sense, in finance it's the same thing. They buy a lot of U.S. bonds, uh, the, our treasury notes, uh, and uh, so they have some kind of control. On the other hand, we also have to be very clear that uh, uh, we have 16, close to 17 trillion in debt. China owns about uh, about trillion, so it's about a little less than one eighth of China's uh, uh, bond is the U.S. So not only uh, does China uh, have some kind of uh, 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 leverage on us, uh, I also uh, would have to uh, caution that the U.S. also has a lot of leverage on China too. So it is the uh, our leaders sometimes do not uh, who do not realize that how much leverage we actually have on China. That's actually pretty uh, problematic to me because we basically exaggerated the, uh, the decline of the U.S. and we do not, therefore, uh, adopt a very 
positive and robust policy in Asia Pacific. Listen, the presence of a very strong, a powerful, and, a, and a active United States in Asia Pacific is not only good for the United States, but also for all the countries in the region, including China itself. And I think a lot of people in the region, Japan, Philippines, Vietnam, are realizing this. So the more China is aggressive, the more coalition these countries are uh, rally around the United States. Miles, do you think uh, China would, would dare to take on Japan in, in the near future? They seem to be itching for a military confrontation with Japan. Yes, the likelihood of that scenario is getting uh, bigger and bigger, and unfortunately, that's because China really viewed Japan as also wounded. Uh, the economy is not as robust as China, and uh, most importantly, China viewed uh, Japan's alliance with the U.S. as the most uh, uh, important danger to its uh, policy in the region. So they were picking a fight with, with Japan. There's no, no question about that, particularly over the issue of Senkaku Island. I think the two countries were, um, were uh, basically getting closer and closer to a real uh, military confrontation. The U.S. has committed to defend Japan, and that's where China wants to use this psychological warfare, including this nuclear uh, uh, scenario, uh, maybe to scare the United States, to warn the U.S. to stay away uh, uh, from a anticipated U.S. Uh, Chinese-Japan uh, military conflict. Uh, do you think that if, if that confrontation took place any time between now and the next two or three years while Barack Obama's in the White House, are, are the Chinese gambling that Barack Obama would not come to the aid of the Japanese? I don't know to what extent the uh, current administration has talked to the Chinese. I understand there is a meeting between uh, President Obama and uh, President Xi last uh, September in, um, in California. The two of them had a face-to-face talk. Uh, I don't know what was going on, but I surely noticed that uh, uh, there was, a, at least on paper, a commitment by the United States to defend Japan. And Japanese know about this, and Chinese uh, should also know about this. Are, are, are the Japanese going to develop a nuclear arsenal? Very unlikely at this point, moment, un- unless the U.S. totally pulls out of uh, uh, Asia Pacific, in which case not only Japan would de- de- uh, uh, develop a nuclear arsenal, South Korea and uh, even countries like Taiwan and Vietnam, they may go uh, nuclear as well. But that's basically you know, the reason why U.S. has to be strong and robust and very assertive in the region. To prevent that kind of nuclear arms race. When do you? When do you? When do the Chinese expect to reach military parity with the U.S.? Well, in certain certain way, they already have. Not particular, not in the conventional sense, but also on issues, for example, cyber. I mean, uh, uh, on that, and and they're developing, uh, for example, space weapon uh, uh, very quickly. So, in that sense, they're 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 trying to trying to uh, uh, to reach a parity. And on space, the U.S. has been sort of withdrawing from the space uh, uh, presence. So we ended our shuttles program, um, and we are participating in the International Space Station, but that is scheduled to come down in 2020 when China uh, is expected to become the only nation in the world who has uh, its own space station. In, uh, so is that also 2020? That's 2020. Is, is 2020 a date that, that is prominent in Chinese military strategy? I don't know for sure. Okay. I don't think that's the case. It all depends on uh, uh, how fast China develops, uh, how quickly uh, its adversaries decline. Mm-hmm. Uh, one last question. Uh, last week there were uh, Chinese PLI troops in Hawaii participating with uh, U.S. troops in a drill. What, what are your thoughts about that? Well, it's a... It's a um, it's a um, disaster relief and humanitarian assistance drill. Uh, that's because China wants to hop up with the United States, and uh, uh, it's part of the military-to-military exchange program. And I think you know uh, what's significant was uh, was this that the, for the first time the Chinese uh, ground troops uh, drill with the United States on American soil in Hawaii. Before that, there was a naval drill, but it mostly on the international sea on, on, on ships. Uh, I think, you know, uh, there is also the issue of reciprocity. Uh, we cannot let Chinese to drill on our soil where Chinese refuse us to drill with them on their sail. They want to sell our toys, we should sell there too.
All right. My guest, uh, Mr. Miles Yu, and uh, he's a, an expert on the Chinese military and military strategies. Uh, his articles appear in the Washington Times. Miles, thank you. Appreciate you being on True News again. You're welcome. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ, this is True News. A fishing lesson for believers in today's moment with Charles Stanley. Now, fishermen have some wonderful qualities about them, and I think it's interesting that probably, not you can't really prove this uh, totally, but possibly seven of those 12 disciples were fishermen. Why would Jesus launch his ministry with a bunch of fishermen? I'll tell you why. How many of you are fishermen? Come on, you gotta be, there's got to be more than a few fishermen in this crowd. Well, is, is that a lady over there? Well, thank you very much, ma'am. Good, I'm glad somebody here is. What do you think about now? Fishermen are daring. They're willing to get out there when the weather's not very good. They're courageous. They hang in there. They don't give up. They're determined. They're patient. They have some wonderful qualities that make for good servants of God. And uh, the man who taught me to fish was one of my deacons in my first church. And I remember a couple of things he taught me that I will never forget. And one of them was this. Uh, We'd been fishing the first time he and I went out. And uh, we were on this big lake up in North Carolina. And I caught a fish about that long. And I thought, oh, my goodness. I was a little embarrassed. And I was getting to pitch him back. He said, don't throw him back. I said, well, he's too small. You can't eat him. Don't throw him back. I said, why not? He says, because if you keep him, you have something to add to. Well, I never thought about such a thing. He says, it's something about having something to add to. Well, that had such an effect on me that and one time when I was head of this organization and I was the treasurer and I stood at the door and took up money and um, nobody was giving anything. So the next time I got a little money and I put it all in change and dumped it in this big jar. And so do you know the next time people came and they saw some money in the jar and before that thing was over with, I had a jar full of money. They were willing to add to. They weren't willing to begin. Sometimes that's the way it is in our life. If we'll just do a little thing God wants us to do, it's easier to do the next thing He wants us to do. Almighty God commissioned me with an assignment to report the fearsome things that are coming upon the world In the last days, if each of us do not keep our souls anchored in Jesus Christ, these things will cause our hearts to faint. We are not to faint. Instead, our Heavenly Father calls upon us to be strong and mighty in His name in the last days. The world is growing darker, but the light of Christ is in us. And we are commissioned by God to shine and radiate because of our love and devotion to God and all things righteous and good. The entire world isn't turning evil. Many lost souls are wondering what is happening, and they're searching for somebody to explain it and make sense of it. As wars and revolutions and natural disasters and strange events in the heavens increase, so will the apprehension of many unsaved people. You have the answer for them salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Isaiah said, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. 